the, obviously prepared today, I was kind of diving into the, the history of you guys and going through all the social media posts and exploring the origins of it. And it was such a fun, like, trip down memory lane. And it struck me, like, how cool it is that so much of that, like, journey is public and it exists for us all to enjoy. Of Like, there's so many, like, VFW shows that we played together or that I photographed you guys played. And then looking through the photos, like, I had totally forgotten that. It's like I knew we had worked together. Or even, like, the, the video, Pulse, the Pulse video that I shared earlier. It was like I knew we'd done a video together, but then seeing it took me right back to that moment, right back to that, like, basement or wherever the hell we were of, like, making that happen. Oh, my God. That was, um, that was the apartment. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was old, old. Yeah. Um, Jordan, just slide up, slide up to the mic or you can pull it towards you, whichever one sounds good. I think you're, yeah, there's a cable there somewhere. There we go. Hell yeah, dude. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed my trip down memory lane, getting ready for this. Um, I want to get right into it, dude. So Jordan and Mike from Values are here. Jordan and Mike. Jordan. <laughs> let's, try, let's try that again. I know someone, someone gave me bad intel earlier, so that's what I wrote here and Fucking read off my shit. thing. Mike, you got, <laughs> Mike, you got tall. Yeah, yeah. Mike, you're looking good, dude. Yeah, um, you're still fucking fat. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> it's great because I should cut that out, but now I have to leave it in because it's a, it's a part of our fine. history. Um, hell yeah. Jordan Baker, welcome, guys. I appreciate you guys coming through making the trip down to the palace here in Meriden. How you guys been? All's good? I'm doing good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everything's been great. Hell yeah, dude. I want to dive right into the yeah classic values, origins. Uh, so yeah, here's my first question. I know we start in 2012. I assume you guys were friends before this. I assume that there is some history before this. Uh, but yeah, take me to 2012. How, who's our first two people? Where does this all start? Well, it's funny because actually um, they were a thing before even I got introduced. I didn't okay. end up joining Values till around 2014, 2015. Okay. Um, but we knew each other through uh, like a bunch of like older waterfront shows back in the day. Like I played in uh, Deathcore Band here as a trader w way, way back with uh, his band with Eyes Like Mine a shit ton. Hell yeah. It was like back in the day where we, we all remember those shows where it was like the same five local bands on every single mm -hmm. show. It was like that. Yeah. So. It, that's how we got to know each other. Hell yeah. Yeah, it was cool. And how, how old are you guys at the time? Are you in high school-ish? I graduated in 09, so if we're going 2012, I was probably... Early 20s. 20, 20, 21. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. 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 Hell yeah. Yeah, it was fun to like explore all the... I, that was a couple years before I came into the picture, before I knew you guys were a thing. But yeah, it was fun to look back on that and fun to have it like cemented in time. Uh, and so my parallel idea here and a story that I've told a little bit here um, is that a couple years ago, I discovered my grandpa's journal from World War II. And so I ended up transcribing it and giving it to our family as like a Christmas gift. Uh, and it was such a cool thing for me to read this thing and go right to him, you know, a century basically before I'm reading it when he's the same age as me, but now <laughs> overseas uh, and in the thick of it. And it's like, we're not quite doing that on a scale here, but it is cool that these time capsules of like whatever those shows were, those five local band shows were, it's cool that, yeah, they're cemented in there and we can always go back to that moment, always go back to those people um, and go back to enjoy, enjoy where we all started from. 2012 comes around. Uh, values gets going. Who are the original people? So values actually started with uh, me and Mike, Mike May. Yep. Um, him and I were neighbors. <laughs> Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yes. hey, Mike. Hey, what's up? <laughs> but no, uh, Mike and I were neighbors, and um, at the time, um, Baker and I were actually in with eyes like mine. Um, that was an active band. Is that like a similar um, genre? Oh, like shit. A similar? Yeah, I wasn't with eyes like mine at that. Point. No, it, oh. I mean that was more metalcore. Okay. Post hardcore. Okay. You know. <laughs> Um, screams, sings, mm -hmm. melodic riffs. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was different, mm -hmm. you know. But Mike was actually like our cameraman, our our merch guy. Mm -hmm. He would just come to every show, hang out with us. You know, mm -hmm. he was really good friends with all of us at the time. Mm -hmm. We got along. But Mike and I, you know, would always get together at his house. He had a little studio set up, and we would just screw around and make music. Mm -hmm. And one day, I said to Mike, I was like, "Hey," I said, "Let's." Uh, Start up like a little side project. And uh, I was pretty, you know, firm at the time. Like, yeah. side project. It's all I want it to be. You know, mm -hmm. maybe play a show here and there. And you're drumming at this point and Mike's on vocals? No, so I was actually writing all the music. Okay. And Mike was doing vocals. Okay. Um, so Mike is actually, I mean, in Values You Hear Us, we're very aggressive, mm -hmm. fast, loud, angry. Um, values didn't start out that way. It actually started off more melodic. Uh, like heavy melodic. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't know. Mike actually has a great singing voice. Interesting. That's and nice to me, yeah. he, he really wanted to be able to display that. Mm -hmm. So we kind of dove right in with that. Um, him and I started writing the music. We got our buddy Steve Wilcox, actually, at the time, involved in the project. Uh, he played guitar. Mm -hmm. So Steve and I on guitar, you know, I would be writing the drum parts. We would figure out the bass stuff together, 
then we had this guy Mike Stoffer join the band and uh we're just like wow we kind of have a full band you mm-hmm. know like if I want to play drums I could play drums Steve could play guitar and started out as a little four piece mm-hmm. and we kind of took it from there um at that time, I think it, uh, it's important for me to go back there because you guys, uh, when values peaks to me, there's a cult following in the local scene where you guys were just a source that everyone wanted to be around. It was always a fun time. Like you guys are, I don't know, you're beloved to our scene. You're, you're a crucial part of it. And so going back to this early time where you guys are figuring out what to do and it's you and Mike trying to figure out what you even sound like, who this thing even is. Uh, yeah, I think an important step of the process to be aware of as it continues to grow. Uh, and then Baker said you come in in 2014. Oh uh, yeah, no. Cause, uh, Actually, it was about the same time that With Eyes Like Mine was kind of like starting to wind down a little bit. Okay. Uh, like, I uh, can't exactly, like, I started playing for them and we did a couple shows here and there. We did like a, like, I, I, what did, what would I finish? What did I start with? What is it? Like, um, it was the, at, not the demo. It was the one after that where we had like the Drowners Swell on it and everything. When that oh, came. for values. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember that timeline. Um. I remember the first song I ever wrote for them was that Drowner Swell song. Mm-hmm. And we dropped that. The first show I did with them was Oceano at the Webster Underground, I think. I, it, That's cool. Okay. So when you joined uh, Values, is already kind of yeah, they were, already doing a thing. Yeah, they were doing like a couple shows here, a couple we shows there. We weren't doing it very well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll uh, say that, you know. Uh, hey, he it, said it, not me. <laughs> no, and, and no, it's true. Uh, we needed a breath of fresh air because at that time, the music we were making... I mean, even though we were proud of what we created and we liked what we wrote, it was very just old and boring. Okay. Um, It was the same Old and boring is like it was from the 70s or old and boring as in you had written it five years ago and it just now brought it to life? It was old to you or old? Old and boring as is just a very repetitive genre. Okay. Um, Everybody else at the time was doing it, so we were doing it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't refreshing. It it was just the same as what was already out there. Yeah. Um, it, it, extremely cookie cutter, mm-hmm. like, um, right. like it was like fill in the blank core bands. Like, Hey, we have synth somewhere or we, Hey, we have like the clean singing guy or we got both, but we didn't, they didn't have either. They had the clean singing, but it was like mm-hmm. kind of like that type of deal. That kind of is the only way to start a band though, is to try and be whatever you, you like listening to. And it's like, it always is going to be a bad version of it, Walmart version of it, <laughs> but it's like, yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. I think of people are always like critical of their first band. It's like, no, that kind of had to suck. It had to be go through that process to end up growing into what it grew into. Um, right. Yeah, no, you have to be terrible in order to figure out uh, yeah. like, okay, this doesn't work. Every, this has been done. Yeah. Let's do something else. Yeah. And I remember when we first started writing, um, but like me and Jordan together, like when mm-hmm. we kind of just started changing the sound and everything, I was playing in a random hardcore band and that wasn't going too, too well. So mm-hmm. I took all the music that I was writing for that record and just down the living hell out of it and then turned it into the violence EP, which Hell yeah. Like uh Cave In was actually already recorded for another band. Just when we we took that one and just down the shit out of it, because I think it was on drop D, we dropped it out. We played and it was G sharp at the time. Okay. So I was just like, you know what, we're gonna make this sound just as gross as possible. And then oh, and yeah. then that's where that came from. When does Corey come into the picture? Uh, so Corey came in a little bit after. Um, okay. Like I said, there was a guy, Mike Stouffer, who played bass with us. And um, he was down to just play whatever. Mike was a really cool guy. Um, he, I mean, the guy went nuts on stage. I mean, he had good stage presence. He, mm-hmm. he was fun to be around. That was you know? all stable and values, yeah. He, replacing he, very him small with guy. Corey was just a smooth transition because mm-hmm. Corey's got great energy. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, Corey came in probably around – Right before the violence EP, we were right in the violence EP, so it had to be around 2014, late 2014. Okay, so a little after Baker, but 2015, I want to say. 2015, yeah, yeah. We, uh, yeah, 2015, because I remember we played. Uh, he was just supposed to be a fill-in for us for a couple shows. Uh, we played a show at Westfield State. Um, you guys played at college? Yeah, we did. Like a <laughs> yeah. dorm, like a house. What you? No, what like uh, the student union. <laughs> like the school said, values should come play here. The school, yeah. some idiot. Well, <laughs> what was, on on what, what was the band? Was it? Was it f- it, yeah, it was fuming, fuming mouth. mouth too. It wasn't yeah. just values. It was values and fuming mouth. Like in a student union. Did someone know someone? Like how does this come to be? I have no idea. None of us really knew the origins of that. We just kind of like showed up one day. Um, That's absurd. It, yeah. It, 
I, I'm looking back on it. I, I see videos from that, and I was just like, hey, I walked by that uh, one on my way to class one day. <laughs> I'm like, shit. Did you go to Westfield State? Yeah, I transferred out of University of Hartford That's cool. uh, right after the pandemic, and then I finished my degree there. So. Oh, okay, so you've pl- you went there after you had played it. I, I yeah. wish it was the other way around. It'd be way cooler to like, play the school you went to. Dude, that would have been hysterical. Your alma mater, yeah. Oh, that would have been hilarious. But was that like college kids? Like, uh, to me, values isn't a normal demographic for college kids, right? Like, values is like the hardcore thing in college. Normally, when I'm thinking of a band playing the student union, it's the, like the pop generic thing that's karaoke and easily accessible to everyone. Who showed up to the show? Did anyone show up to the show? What happened inside it, of the student union? It was actually, if I remember correctly, it was like... it. Since it was like a small show. space, yeah, yeah, it was a weird. It was a weird demographic. It was I like a bet. mix of both. Yeah, like it was the kids who go to shows, and then the kids who were just really bored on a Saturday night and didn't want to just hang out and drink in their dorm. They wanted to drink in their dorm and then get their ears blown off. I mean, like, I don't <laughs> understand it personally, but that was sick. Um, <laughs> That's so outrageous. Uh, this is such a random tangent. I work some college events, so I do like fall and spring shows for them oftentimes, and sometimes it's like a spring weekend. So last year, one of the schools I did had uh, uh, Uncle Joey from Full House performing, <laughs> uh, and he was doing stand-up comedy, which was like just kind of sad. Like, it, was not, it was cool to me to be around him and see him, but it was also just kind of sad of like, dude, there's no way. Like, come on. Like, there's got to be a better thing for you to do than come here to this small school in Connecticut and do stand-up comedy for drunk kids who don't like they don't even know you um the problem here is that they did this in like the middle of the quad of dorms oh god and so like two minutes into the show kids from like their dorm rooms are screaming out the window and like ruining the show and it was one of those like who didn't think that was immediately gonna be what was happening here like it's a friday night it's late at night you're in the middle of the quad like how are you going to control that and figure out where the voices are coming from and i'm here in the westfield state show (laughs) and it's like (laughs) yeah these things aren't too well planned sometimes like yeah no absolutely not like uh you went to U-Hart, so obviously mm-hmm. you remember all the spring fling stuff. I remember one year, 303 played. Brilliant. Yeah, so I was just, I remember seeing the, like, the people who were coming. I'm like, fucking 303 is playing mm-hmm. here? Who thought this was a good idea? I didn't know 303 was even still Dude, a thing at the time. I did Jeremiah at two schools this spring. So Jeremiah's like the birthday sex guy. And it's like, who hired this guy to come play for 18-year-olds? Dude, he played he played U-Hart my freshman year. <laughs> Dude, that season would I get a kill at off colleges. <laughs> 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 that's, so, that's his demographic, I guess. Dude, fucking T-Pain played the Webster for Trinity Kids one time. That was that's pretty cool. That was hysterical. That's pretty cool. Oh. He, uh, yeah, I did it at UConn one time. So yeah, they there must be a, a group of artists who just do the college circuit and make money off of that. Hey, yo, we Which, haven't been popular in the last 20 years. Let's start playing colleges. It's a good bag, though. I mean, it's... it's uh, isn't isn't Soldier Boy coming to the uh, uh, Webster? Yeah, but that's not a college thing. That doesn't count. I mean, it does, but... Like the real Soldier Boy. Yeah, like yeah. Crank Dad Soldier Boy. Not like Boy. Taylor Swift is coming to the Webster Underground. For like, <laughs> oh, my God. I saw that, and I was like, okay, who's fucking with us? Yeah, it's a karaoke <laughs> night, but it's just poorly marketed. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of how, like, uh, emo night is 80s nights for people our age, which mm-hmm. is sad that those exist now. But yeah. It's sick, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't want an 80s night already. I love them, but it feels bad to buy a ticket and go to one. <laughs> um Values, dude. So Baker is going in. Corey joins the band. At some point, we're playing schools. Uh, what else stands out is like crazy shows from this early time. I assume there's shows from 2012 to 14 that there's two people at as well. Like I'm sure you play the whole gamut of shows. Like, yeah, what stands out from those early formative years? So one of the one of the first shows we actually played was, uh, I mean, we, we covered Oceano, which I mean that show itself was pretty wild. Yeah. Um, but we played. Are you guys like? Sorry, I'm interrupting you, but are you guys like lifelong Oceano fans? Was that like a, a peak experience for you or just a hardcore band that is respected and that makes it cool? I mean, I've always respected them and liked mm-hmm. Oceano. Yeah. I mean, so it was cool just to be thrown on that bill and mm-hmm. get to play with them. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I know Baker. Uh, Depths is the best death chord record to ever come out, yeah. and I will die on that hill. All right. That's all I got to say about Oceano. <laughs> Hell yeah. I'll listen to that record for the first time tonight. Sorry, Baker. Uh, um, Jordan, back to you. <laughs> But no, um, what I was going to say is an, uh, another weird show we ended up on in the early stages of Values was actually Attila. Hell yeah. Um, on a Monday night in, I think it was like a snowstorm. Oh my God, I forgot about that. That's as good as it gets. Hit us. What happens? And we ended up being playing the uh, underground, but it was before the main doors opened. Mm-hmm. So we just had like everybody packed Like the in perfect there. time. The perfect time. Yep, it really it. was. It was the perfect time. And... Um, this is actually when I was still playing guitar in Values. Okay, I didn't know it was an um, era. Hell yeah. Yes, so the beginning of Values, first couple of years, I was playing guitar. Okay. Um, we had our buddy Paul Frasco playing drums. 
Um, Paul was in the band with Baker before we brought <laughs> Baker over. So when Baker came over, we kind of were just like, hey, Paul, come play drums. So we've had a lot of members that people don't know about that. Bands are so inbred always. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, but yeah, that, that show was, it was weird because I'm pretty sure it was like Attila and like Icy Stars and it, we didn't fit it at all. Mm-hmm. We didn't fit the bill at all. And it's when we were really transitioning our sound to the new material that Baker was working on. Mm-hmm. So we were definitely going in a, a heavier, thrashier direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and overall, the response we got was actually really surprising. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I I forgot about that show, and I remember it was so goddamn cold out, and like people just rushed in just to get out of the cold, and like right. you, you know the Webster Underground, it's yeah. like a 300, 350 cap room, like that place they they shut that 15 minutes after doors open, they're like nope, no one else in here, we understand you got to be cold, sorry, wait in line. Oh, that that was a nuts day though, I remember that. That's wild. That was insane. I forgot. It's just fun. Those underground shows are, yeah, there's so many of them that I would have forgotten about otherwise had they not lived on through someone's memory. Um, hell yeah, dude. So then we get going. Uh, what is like the original? This is kind of a dumb question. I was thinking about like values and like starting a band. Why does value start? What makes you start a band? Like you said, it was kind of a side project, but then like as the guys come in, uh, so Baker, I guess when you come on, like are you just hoping to play shows with your buddy? Are you coming on like we are? this is our business that we're starting. We're in the long-term picture. Like what is the, what is the initial intention with the band? Um, I, I just like having fun. Yeah. Like literally that's like the, the short and long of it. Like mm-hmm. it, it's just, it, I've always done bands just cause it's always been a great time. Like I've always liked just being sweaty in front of people, just playing my ass off. It's a really good release too. Mm-hmm. I, I like, if I can play devil's advocate though, it's like, it's not always a good time. Though. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot of band breakups. It's a lot of, uh, Mike's been a great singer for you guys, but there's always a lot of, you know, the singer who's MIA or whoever the band member is who's not carrying their weight. Like, it seems from the outside, like, there's no way it could be that much fun. But the singer's only MIA when the drums need to be loaded in. All right? sure. <laughs> or any, any of your cabs need to be loaded hey, in. Hey, hey, hey. I move my own shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, I, but for me, the good has always outweighed the bad. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, like those, you can't look back at like the bad times as like being like the thing of the band. Like I always like, yeah, there's some parts that are absolute shit that I'm just like, yeah, that sucked. Mm-hmm. But usually it's outweighed by something like, yo, that was sick or yo, that was hilarious. Or how the hell did we end up in Plattsburgh, New York at 3 a.m.? Yeah. And why are we in this hotel room right now? It's like, it's stuff like that that makes it worth it to me. Mm-hmm. Like, that's like the best part about it. And that's what I miss about it right now. To, to be honest, just being able to to travel around for sure yeah, and that's, yeah. check out different places mm-hmm. that we've never been before, meet new bands, mm-hmm. uh, just new people in general. I mean, yeah, definitely miss doing that. Eat new pizza. Eat, Eat a new, new, new pizza. Plattsburgh, yeah. I'll, I'll, dude. <laughs> Plattsburgh pizza. Okay, there was a spot in Plattsburgh, New York. Okay. We were loading in, and um, the guys in. What band was it? I think that uh, I think that was Beast. Might have been Beast. Yeah, it was definitely Beast. Beast or Oakheart, one of the two. But anyway, they they told us they're like, oh, you got to try this pizza place across the street. Now, dude, I'm all about pizza. <laughs> all right, I got I got a pizza slice tattooed on my leg. Hell like, yeah, I'm about pizza. Okay, yeah. so I was yeah, like, that's oh, well, one of the like three things you and me have in common. We both got yes. pizza tattooed on us. So I was like, well, what's so special about this place? And they're just like, they do cold cheese. I'm like, okay don't know what that is. Like, yep. fill me in here. And they're like, so they take the oven out. They had like a brick oven. They take the pizza out and then they just take, as it's steaming hot, a handful of just fresh mozzarella cheese and just throw it on top of it and just hand it to you. So as you're getting mm-hmm. the pizza, you're just watching this cheese just melt on top of it. And it, dude, it was just incredible. Like, interesting. People who like make like pizza weird just annoy me. Like the whole, it's just like, just there's one way to make pizza. Just do that. Yep. But I, yeah, that's my culinary expertise in a nutshell, I guess. <laughs> but hey, there's always new ways to do it, unless you're putting pineapple on it. That's uh, I, that's where you draw the line. That, of all draw, the things in your life, that's that, where you draw the line. That's just it. I have I have a couple of lines that I do not cross. Pineapple on pizza is one of them. That's uh, it. Uh, we were talking about the yeah, kind of the band memories and the ups and downs of it all. And I got some advice recently that it's like there's good memories that you enjoy like in the moment. But there's those memories that you don't enjoy now, but you will enjoy them in the future. And those are almost the more enjoyable ones or the better stories or the better hangs or the things that stand out. And I remember when we first look back at the past, uh, what stands out in that values 
gig is something that like for sure wasn't enjoyable that drive to Plattsburgh or I don't know what the band break van breaks down somewhere show where no one showed up like yeah what stands out is something that wasn't enjoyable then but is now <laughs> something that's kind of memorable and something you're proud of the mole trap <laughs> the mole I <laughs> Baker what is the mole trap so uh, the a lot of these stories you're going to hear are probably going to revolve around this, uh, like a couple of Plattsburgh trips. We, I remember we got back from one. What's in Plattsburgh? I've never heard of anyone like it, it, just like a venue that you it, guys played a there lot. There's a venue out there called the Monopole. We only we we played Monopole in this place called Fuzzy Ducks. Okay. Um, and the people up there are just super chill and everything, and we just always had like a really really good time up there. Okay. And like ever like there was always good food and stuff. They had um, their own little scene for sure, but yeah. it was it was welcoming, mm-hmm. you know. Um, a lot of the people up there just are there for the music. They don't care who's playing. They're, they they want to check out new artists. They wanted to listen to new bands. Um, so when we went up there, I mean, immediately after playing our set, I mean, we just kind of felt welcome. We had a lot of people come up to us and talk to us and be like, oh, man, that was awesome. You know, you guys cool. sounded great. And just be able to sit the rest of the night kind of talking, talking mm-hmm. music, talking about the band. And um, oh, the scene was really cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool scene up there. Hell yeah, um, so the mole trap um, <laughs> somewhere. In- so we were finished offloading everything and putting it uh, back back into Jordan's house. And I, it's, I, I, I'm one of those people, I see something shiny, I have to touch it. It's like one of those things. And sure. he has this uh, mole trap in his garage. And he didn't know what it was. I'd never seen one before. Okay. And I'm just like, yo, Jordan, why do you have one of the things from Saw in your garage? <laughs> And he was like, Baker, don't touch that. And I, as soon as I pick, pick it up, the thing goes off. I didn't know it was loaded. I don't know what an unloaded mole trap looks like, but just like. T- you found out pretty quickly. Yeah, it, took, like. it yeah. took a chunk off my it finger. It took a chunk off his finger. He came out of the garage. We heard it go off, and Corey was just like, Baker, what happened? And he's holding <laughs> his finger up, and there was literally just like missing flesh. And this is after <laughs> a drive home, so I assume you guys drove after all the way there. After a very long, played the show, drove four and a half home. hour drive home. So it's three or four in the morning and you guys are going oh, through no, all this. No, this was in the afternoon. We, s- we stayed the night. We off. actually oh, stayed the okay, night, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, thank yeah. goodness, okay. Yeah, no. Um, and it's funny, actually, that was the same finger I just recently sliced my hand open with, when, too, when I was trying to open a package. Nice. Um, yeah, me and sharp objects do not get along and I have not learned that lesson yet, but nice. that's it. That was like crappy, but it was like one of the better memories that I have from like all of that. As weird as that sounds, what makes it stand out like so so fondly? It just kind of like shows how dumb I am. And sure, it, that, that's what I like about it. I'm just like, okay, that just makes sense because it, yeah. it, it fits the lore. I think yeah. it just capped off a, a good weekend. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's something you guys can all laugh about. And yeah, I'm sure some, Corey has something a we can, of you definitely out. something we can laugh about. We have a lot of things, oh, honestly, God. we can laugh about. You guys always have. Yeah, I mean, I've watched Corey throw his base cabinet down. Flight uh, of stairs. A flight of stairs because he was mad at it. Just walks out of the venue. He's got it over his head. I remember I was sitting in my truck actually showing um, our buddy Joe some <laughs> some new music. And we're sitting there. I mean, I got the volume decently cranked. And, you know, bands are changing over. We just got done playing. Corey's bringing some stuff out. And we just hear somebody yelling. And Joe just looks over and goes, what's that? And then there's Corey with this 810 cab over his head, okay, lifting it up. And he's yelling and swearing. And people are just like, what is going on? And he's just like, that's it. And he chucks this thing. Down a flight of stairs, throws it, thing hits the ground. I mean, explodes. And Joe, you just see him roll my window up in my truck. And he's just like, dude, (laughs) he was scared. He had no clue what was going on. And I'm just like, oh, boy. (laughs) Uh, Actually, that's like one of my favorite things that happens with us. Like, because we uh, like Corey, he is the human personification of the too angry to die meme. Mm -hmm. He he just is. And he best dude in the world, hands down, best dude in the world. But watching him go off and then watch other people freak out. And all of us were just like. Yeah, this is like a Tuesday for us. Like, that this is normal. One yeah. of my early takeaways is that you guys are all like big personalities and you're all like, uh, respectfully, you guys, I'd be intimidated to walk into a bar and just like chat with, like, I don't know, you're just big people. Like, Jordan, especially, is just like a big guy. Like, Mike is just like, I don't know, he's artistic and he just seems like eclectic, I guess would be the word to me, of like just quirky. It's like, I wouldn't know how to. And like, you guys are all the nicest, softest people behind the scenes, and especially like on stage, the music that comes out of you guys is not friendly or welcoming, and the <laughs> the performance itself isn't. But then coming off stage, there is always that. I mean, it must be cathartic, I guess, to get all the the angst out, and you get to just be the regular version of you off stage. If, um, if people get the opportunity to to actually chat with Mike, mm-hmm. they will have a great conversation. He's, yeah, a fascinating Mike, guy. Mike is a very fascinating so guy, smart, yeah. and he's he's very smart. 
Um, like you said, artistic. I saw um, his art hanging he's, upstairs. Yeah, oh, dude, he's, he's, he's incredible. He's insane. And, um, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, actually, most of uh, when he was ta- remember when he was uh, apprenticing to be tattooed, like yeah, uh, yeah he did a tattoo mm-hmm. yeah, apprenticeship. He was doing that, and that, his stuff was awesome. Mm-hmm. I have a bunch of his stuff on. I was gonna say all, all three of well. us actually have uh, me, Corey Baker, have. Um, tattoos from Mike when he was he was doing that mm-hmm. so that's pretty cool you know look back on and be like hey you know this one means this which one means this and I see this I'm like that one had one of my best friends do that you that's know? cool yeah and I'm laughing at the image of like Jordan holding the cab up of like yeah that's a if I am the photographer and I'm walking out, I'm like, I'm calling the cops on that guy. Like, I am so scared of that oh. man. What the hell is going through his head? Like, he's about to go back inside and kill someone. Like, I don't know what he's doing, but it's nothing good. But Corey's like, or, yeah, Corey's like the nicest guy. Like, there's not, like, whatever he was doing was his own thing. But there's never going to be anyone else involved in that. Like, that was just him being him. And that was going to end. And, yeah, somehow that was a, a peaceful, logical resolution to him. But you could still go up to him afterwards, tap him on the shoulder, and he would help you with whatever you're going to ask him about, which is the craziest, like, duality to me. Um, but, yeah, fun times to look back on. <laughs> God, it's just so entertaining watching people react to him when yeah. he's going off. And we're just sitting back at the merch table just like, yeah. <laughs> laughing at yep. it because we know it's going to be over in about five seconds mm-hmm. hell yeah uh right around 2015 2016 then it starts to get kind of more real-ish i would assume it starts to gain more steam uh and it was cool as i was yeah going back through my memory lane it's like there's there's warp tour going on at some point in these couple years there's more webster headliners uh or headline of the webster and opening for other shows uh, there's also fan tattoos which kind of stuck out as an interesting thing of like yeah, when you're 2012 and you and Mike are starting this thing as a side project, and now at some point in those years, someone gets your logo tattooed on them, like, that's a, a huge road, and it must be a bizarre thing to see someone come up to you and be like, yeah, here's this thing on me. For, for that to happen, and for us to get to that point, I mean, that's really this guy here. When he came into the band, I mean, we took a risk changing our sound completely, mm-hmm. going with a different direction, something that, I, I don't know, not a lot of people were really making – you know, the music we were making at the time, you know, Mm -hmm. especially locally. Um, So we didn't know how people were going to react to it. We didn't know if people were going to love it. We didn't know if people were just going to be like, what is this? (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, And we got, I mean, a lot bigger of a reaction than I think any of us really expected. Um, Like you said, I mean, a couple of people with the values logo tattooed on their legs. And uh, I mean, that's just wild to me, honestly. Like I never would have thought that. Do you remember the first time seeing one of the tattoos on someone? I think it was Matt Wood. Yeah, it was it was Matt. Uh, I remember I remember seeing it and I didn't know it, like I heard that somebody did it and I was like, "Wait, what?" And then he, I saw it and I was like, "Yo, that's insane." But this uh the guy who got this done, he's the type of guy who would go to like the 21 plus only shows before he was 21 and just stand outside and just listen. He's yep. he's like that's all cool. about the music and he it, he's a, one of our close friends now and he's a super super sweet guy. Um, and the fact that we have that spot on him is just super humbling and super honoring to us. Like that mm-hmm. was just, that was so cool when I found out about that. And it, actually there's a funny story about that. Cause the first time he saw us was, I think it was at the crossroads in Palmer. And uh, he told, he told me this, like it, it kind of like backing up where he, where he were just like, yeah, all of you guys are big personalities. Um, I guess uh, there was a band I liked playing, and I might have punched him at one point, and uh, he was just like, yo, I thought you were like a dick at first, and then we actually met, and I'm just like, oh, listen, I am so sorry about that. <laughs> I have very bad spatial awareness, and you see how lanky I am. And now that he now he had my band tattooed on him, I'm like, yo, from punching to getting tattooed, I've just done nothing but hurt you a little bit now, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> that's for life. You'll continue to scar him. <laughs> Hell yeah. I mean, that's, that's crazy. It doesn't like... Uh it doesn't make sense to me. And I think it's, just, it's new to me in that, like, yeah, I've never started a band. I feel like I've spent so much time around you, like around the band world that I feel like I have as most, a lot of the experience, but that first person experience of walking, seeing someone walk up to it, my logo on them is for, it's not a photographer thing for his artists. It'd be very bizarre if it was, it, it, it'll um, be a thing eventually, but yeah, in the context of the band, it's like, it, it's just wild to me. And it's like, you're writing your story. And for someone, I think the other piece there is like, it's so personal. It is so inherently you guys. It's so closely tied to who you are as human beings that it's not just a, uh, it's not just a piece of art that you made. It is representative of the whole body of your life, in a sense. I mean, it's like a crazy thing for someone to, yeah, carve out a square inch on their body for. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's. As I said, it's just it's honoring more than anything else. Mm-hmm. That's the only right. way I can really say it. And like when, when we started really going the direction we were going in, 
I didn't expect it. Like as Jordan said, we we didn't expect it to catch on at mm -hmm. all. Like I was just like, okay, I want to take make this like the truest sense of like what a metalcore band is. Like mm -hmm. all the good, really good aspects of metal, all the really good aspects of hardcore, just to kind of like throw them into a blender. Like really, uh, really 2005. This shit. Like mm -hmm. back when like like the that style was really starting to like kind of like develop and everything, and then it got like shaped and evolved and everything. Like uh, like we all grew up listening to like those older bands like On Broken Wings. Uh, was like a really big one for me growing up like barrier dead barrier dead like like the people what people call like the mosh core bands now like thick as blood stuff like that and mm. it's just i was just like okay i'm gonna just take all of that throw it into a blender and then just kind of like slightly market it towards like the metalcore community just because i know like that's like the bigger community out here and i know like if there are those band people who like like bands like Attila and everything, or and then they'll just like have that middle ground where they're just like, well, I like Attila, I like this, but I also like these three really heavy bands, and like, mm -hmm. there's always like the spot for like that middle ground where you have like the people who like the mainstream ones, and then the people who really like those like really crazy like heavy heavy bands. I'm um, hearing you guys. I mean, the the classic adage is build it and they will come, right? Like I'm hearing you guys almost say that of like, yeah, no one else was doing this, but we wanted to do it, and we just said, sure, let's figure it out, and it'll it'll take off. I mean, we can, we kind of incorporate a little bit of everything. Thing, like with the violence CP, you know, we had our heavier, you know, uh, I guess you could call them breakdowns, you know, mm -hmm. um, we had the thrashy riffs, we had some hardcore, you know, influenced riffs. Yeah. And um, it just meshed really well. Um, what, else, what else stands out was like the highlights around then. So yeah, tattoos to me are highlights. I know playing Warp Tour must have been crazy. Headlining the Webster must have been crazy. What else stands out is, or yeah, one of those had the highlights or what else stands out as like the... Damn, that was a that was a moment where we had it back in the day. I think 2017 New England Metal Hardcore Festival. Oh was yeah, a pretty cool moment. Okay, um, playing that. Uh, where is that? Yeah, give me give me that story. So Worcester Palladium. Okay, uh, we got on the 2017 you know Metal Hardcore Fest. Is this um, the one with the DCU's also associated, or is it all in the Palladium? It's all at the Palladium. Okay. Yeah, so they had the upstairs stage and the downstairs stage that year. I believe the big headliner was Testament on the day we played, which mm -hmm. was pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, but like Currents was on that. Um. Yeah, it was like Currents Left Behind, uh, Varials, they were on there. I Am. I Am, actually. It was their first New England date ever. They they and opened up the entire day. Like, they were the first band to go crazy. on. And I remember just sitting there listening to them, and I'm like, why are these guys opening? Like, they, they, they were so full-sounding, so big. Mm -hmm. I mean, just so professional. I mean, obviously, like, a lot of people know about them now. Mm -hmm. um, they've made a pretty big name for themselves. But, yeah. like, at the time, it's just like... What did we do in playing after these guys? You know, it was just weird. Body Snatcher um, played one of the like VFW shows somewhere in Agawam, and I stumbled across it earlier. And I think you guys were a part of it, maybe, or Valleys might have oh. been. Oh, um, but I've always had the same reaction of like, how did that happen? Of like, now they're big and doing everything, and I just remember them as this VFW band from <laughs> so long ago. Uh, but yeah, it's cool to watch that watch that journey grow and watch them come back. It's funny because uh, I, th I think I was actually at that Body Snatcher show you're talking about. I think that was up in uh, Florence. That's where it was. Yeah, yeah yep. no, because uh, one of the promoters up there, he oh, it, like it's funny. Some of the bands he would book were the bands like Body Snatcher, or Varials. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be just on that cusp of being like those like headliner Webster bands. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, we're on like these small tours doing this, that, and the other thing, and they'd be going through all of that. And it's it's nice to know that we kind of we actually got the opportunity to play with a lot of those bands before they got to that like level where they were just like doing like strictly like the tours like mm -hmm. this these were like one-off dates every once in a while yeah. or they were like routing dates back home or something and i think that body snatcher show actually was one of their routing dates back home and that was like i went to that because i was just like i think uh i think our i think actually low was playing if i'm not mistaken i, and I don't think so. we were, i don't think we were on it but i think our okay. friends in low were on on it and i just went to hang out and like body snatcher i was just like this is just so heavy mm -hmm. And it, it, it's like, as you said, it's one of those things. It's wild to see where they get, like, the steam just keeps going and going and yeah. going. There's so many bands from that era, like that 2016, 2017 era, that have just blown up over the years. And it's a lot of it is due to those, like, small, like, VFW shows that, mm -hmm. like, bands like us were lucky enough to be a part of. And it's, yeah. it's great to see that. And, like, that's honestly actually really cool to think about, too. I'm like, yeah, we were playing to these guys in a room maybe full of, like, 150 people, and now they're pa playing to, like, the main stage like palladium like almost fully yeah. packed that's nuts yeah it's cr that's like a really cool thing that, that i think of it's sometimes it's kind of like i mean uh, do you ever go to any of the waterfront shows i think that was a little bit before me yeah i don't feel like i didn't go to too many so i mean that was a great venue to catch bands when they were starting out that are i mean 
we would see volumes play in front of 30 people there. Um, you know, uh, Abacab. Uh, structures. Structures, Legend, um, Casey Strain, you know, bands yeah. like that. And, I mean, it, it just, actually, I don't know, uh, maybe. Actually, yeah, no, actually, one of the craziest shows I ever played was actually at the waterfront. And I've played a lot of a crazy, sh- crazy shows, and most of them have been with Attila for some reason. Uh, it was uh, here, back when I was in Here Lies Trader, the Attila in the, in the midst of the lions. lions, that that tour, yeah, that tour I remember like very specifically. I know it's not like a value story, but mm-hmm. it's like I think Chelsea was Chelsea Grin on that. No, no, that wasn't Chelsea Grin. That there was, was there was another big deathcore band at the time. In the midst of lions, uh, I, d- I declare war. Maybe no, I declare war was the Shook tour, and that was a few years later. Wow, how the fuck do I remember this? I hit my head yeah, way little, too much. You got a crazy Wikipedia of brain bands. Well, I grew some some of those shows you just remember. Like yeah. there there are lineups that like if I you know I tell you now like there was a lineup that was, um, it was Vanna. Oh God, it was Vanna, Icy Stars, Our Last Night, and then the headlining band was the Number Twelve Looks Like You. <laughs> but this was like no we that was you know, we it, games Romans was on that too. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we even better. So, I mean, this is in a hall, mm-hmm. a beat up just hall in the middle of Western Mass that maybe, I don't know, 70 kids showed up to. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Maybe half of them were in the local bands that opened. Uh, aside from the student union, what stands out is like the worst values show location. Or maybe, I don't know, worst is not like. I don't mean worse as in they had no sound equipment, but just like it was in a shed. It was in the ice cream shop. We've talked about the cupcake shop that had a couple shows around here. We've oh, my God. We played, a, we played uh, a couple garages. We played a carpet store. A yeah, carpet, carpet store. store. <laughs> carpet store in Vermont. Yeah. I, <laughs> what, I, is, what does that mean? Uh, a legit exactly carpet what store. you think. Yeah. <laughs> like someone, I, I think someone was living in the bathroom because there was legit like straight up toothpaste, toothbrush, shampoo. Deodorant. All of that stuff was just chilling out in there. That's good. Yeah. No, yeah, I was just... It, rural Vermont. That's all I got to say. Somebody knew somebody that owned like a, just a mom and pop carpet store. Okay. And the warehouse was, you know, uh, basically like a two bay, three bay garage, I guess you could say. But it had tall ceilings on it, huge storage shelves with all these rolled up carpets. And then just in the middle, they were just like, oh, hey, let's just have a hardcore show here. Yeah. And it, it was it was so weird. <laughs> Did it go okay, given the... Yeah, it was cool. Like, uh, people went. I guess there's not much to do in rural Vermont except go <laughs> hang out at a carpet yeah. store. Yeah. That was cool. I, I, thank you for reminding me about that. I can yeah, that, That's absurd. Does anything else stand out or come to mind immediately uh, as, like, a, a wild place you guys have played? Uh, no, but I've always wanted to play a storage unit, to be completely honest with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I love those really close, kind of crusty. Yeah. yeah, I love, like, the... In, uh, unconventional venues like mm-hmm. yeah you can play like vfw halls and stages and theaters all you want but like yeah give me give me like a hot storage container mm-hmm. with just a generator hooked out back and like like just let me rip that's what i want to do you guys always felt like right on the edge of diy like i never would quite call values a diy band because there was a thousand cabs on the stage at all times i don't know why that is associated with diy in my brain but like you guys were always running that cusp of like doing everything it felt like everything was done by hand done by you guys but it was always done professionally and well i think the Maybe perhaps the underbelly of DIY is that it's unprofessional or done kind of amateurishly. And I don't think that's a fair statement for you. I feel like there was always a, a high quality to the thing, but it was always done with duct tape behind the scenes as well. Uh, yeah, it was definitely um, the submersible. Uh, we were the submersible <laughs> before the submersible was the submersible. Towards the end of us being a band, and this is like embarrassing because like 10 years ago, we would hate ourselves for doing this. We started having practice completely di through my interface and i would have an electric drums kit hooked up and we would sit down there so rather my, my acoustic i mean my regular drum set's sitting right there mm-hmm. baker's full stack and Corey's, you know cabs and amps are sitting right there it's, so it's just like hey let's tone it down a little bit tonight let's let's turn down the volume a little bit and uh let's just do everything electric and di <laughs> and, uh, and it's like i look back at it and i'm just like I mean, it was like right before we broke up, and I'm just like, that, now I'm like, why did we do that? <laughs> that, that? That was us signing the divorce papers when yeah, we pretty, started doing that. I'm, pretty much. It, it was slowly killing me mm-hmm. inside because it, it, it's like your stuff's behind glass, and you're just like, I just want to touch it. It's right there. No, no, no. We got to be quiet. We got to be quiet. No, it, but it's right there. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. Uh, 
yeah, that was it, it. Yeah, ten years old, ten years ago, like I guarantee you, if ten years ago, like twenty year old me saw me doing that, I, Corey would kick my sentence. ass. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Corey, would, Corey could still kick all of our asses for doing that. No, but back then, like even the words left my mouth, I'd be yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. dead on arrival. Yep. Uh, feel free to help yourself if you want anything else, or yeah, oh, feel no. free to That's good. make it happen. You guys are interested. Um, Hell yeah. Uh, my other kind of note here is what stands out as like smaller, more personal victories. So we kind of talked about like the big shows, but I'm wondering like, is there a moment in value? Like you guys always enjoy each other's company. Like I think that that's a key part of things. We talked about the friendship and how part of the start of the band is just getting to hang out with people and meet people. Like what stands out as like the little milestones along the way that, that made this thing worth doing. I mean, uh, headlining the the Webster Underground is a cool thing, but I don't feel like that's what gets you out of bed in the morning. I feel like it's the, the more mundane stuff that kind of goes behind the scenes that is more meaningful and more memorable often. Uh, the fact that people, uh, like, as you brought up earlier, me using, like, a million cabs, that's what got me going. The mm -hmm. fact that I got to play out of all of those speakers mm -hmm. as loud as I possibly wanted to, that's what kept me going, because I love doing that. Yeah. Just because the sound and, like, the way that... Excuse me. The way it makes you feel and everything, and like mm -hmm. the, it, when you feel the air pushing against you, and that's what really like kept me going. Because like the music had an energy, and that had its own energy, and like the two combined, it was just it just made it feel really, really good. Mm -hmm. Unless something broke, and then I would get mad, <laughs> and then have to fix it, and then it would feel really good because I'd be like, ah, oh, now I'm not mad anymore, but I'm still mad, so I'm gonna make it sound madder than normal. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for me, like as far as personal wins like if we're talking more individual mm -hmm. uh being in this band definitely was more challenging um in terms of you know the music um especially from being a drummer i mean baker writes very fast so i mean to be able to okay let's play at this tempo mm -hmm. to keep up to that um you know made me a better drummer you know made me a better musician um it just overall you know it the band itself, I think, kind of everybody became better musicians. Just oh yeah, hundred percent. You're you're actually insanely easy to lock into, and I've worked with a ton of drummers over the years, and it was just like it would just work because I would be able to say I'm like, okay, we're starting this at 140, and we're gonna crank it to 190 randomly, and you're just gonna have to keep up. Yeah. And it, it, like yeah, at, at the beginning they'd be like, wait, what are you saying? I'm like, I'm saying we're cranking it to 190 at this part, and he's like. No, we're not. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, we are. And it, it would work out and it would be smooth, mm -hmm. hilariously enough, because that's like a big jump. Yeah. Like relatively speaking, like mostly most of the time in like modern music, I feel like it's going from fast to like super slow. It's not going from like mid to like <laughs> over yeah, like, holy crap, we're going to get hit by a train. Um, yeah. It, and that was just like something that's always really, really good. And like writing, I know I don't have to worry about like certain stuff like not flowing the way I wanted to because I know for a fact he'd be there to kind of like pick it up and just be like okay I know exactly what to do with this part do this that and the other thing because I don't understand drums I'd be like yeah just do you know the the thing with the, mm -hmm. the you hit the thing and then you do the thing with the feet and you no idea what the hell any of that means what does a practice look like for you guys or what did practice look like for you guys I mean was it a was it a party was it a work session was it loud was it late Friday night was it Monday every day at, or every Monday at 4 p.m. like there's a lot of distractions and a lot of beer okay <laughs> <laughs> if, if I'm gonna be honest yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, at Bangers Hotel baby yeah. hell yeah uh, uh, we used to play uh, our practice space used to be located up in Holyoke okay um and that's what it used to be called the Headbanger Hotel, and there was every room was rented out by bands, and that's cool. It was pretty cool because you could just be there. Like we we would usually make like what Thursday nights uh, at that time. I well, think for a little while we were there like two three times a week. We would be yeah, yeah. early on. I mean we were there a lot, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the the bands that were there. I mean you become friendly with them, so it's like you're sitting there practicing, and the next thing you know you have seven people just walking. You like you know open the door, mm -hmm. walking on into your practice space, and they're just sitting there jamming. They got beers, and next thing you know you start talking, and forty five minutes goes by, and it's just like, hey, we've only done two songs today so far. You yeah. know, I mean, a lot of distractions, a lot of it, but it, it, it's cool too because when you're in that space, I think uh, when we first moved in there, our, our practice space was next to slip dash not so we got like we would finish playing and then we would got to heat we got to hear like uh you just hear weight and bleed playing through the wall <laughs> yeah exactly and i was just like yeah this is cool yeah this is really cool and you were able to drink as much as you want and no one cared and smoke inside so i was like i was totally about it like yeah, that our, was that was really fun our first base um it was actually around the corner it was an old building and 
we had this massive, I mean, I don't even know the size of it, but huge room. And we actually wrote and recorded the violence EP at that space. I mean, we self-produced it, uh, did everything on our own, but that spot had, we lucked out because it was a studio prior to us renting it out as a spot. And then I just kind of used it as my own studio space and practice space. And it had a vocal booth. I mean, it had a huge spot for drums to be set up. Um, and now it's a U-Haul. And yeah, U-Haul <laughs> decided to, we, we didn't even know about it. So the owner didn't contact any of us, nothing. Like our gear was on the verge of just being like U-Haul property. Uh, I mean, I'm talking, you know, my Truth Custom kit, all his yeah. orange cabs, like four or five different guitars. Like we went to the practice space one day because we didn't go for like maybe two weeks. Maybe one of us was on vacation. I forgot what it was, mm -hmm. whatever the reason. So we all meet there, and there's just a notice on the front of the building, and it's like to all, you know. All tenants, all get tenants, your shit out. Uh. You need to be out by this date at this time, and that date was tomorrow at noon, or this stuff is like ours. And it's just like, what? Damn. <laughs> I mean, I have my buddy, uh, some of my friends in Louisiana, I think the practice space got like four clothes with stuff inside of it and they had to like break into the place to get their stuff out and like sneak it out. And it was, just, yeah. We like, were mess. literally there to like the minute. Yep. We had so much stuff in there. I'm I, sure you guys had a couple cabs in there. <laughs> cabs, equipment. I mean, we had furniture, couches, because yeah. I, like I said, the space was huge. So we actually yeah. had. We had a fridge. <laughs> we had a fridge. Full, yards, yeah, yeah. We had a full size beer fridge in there. I mean. It was a really cool spot. I mean, I mm. miss it. I, yeah. If I could go back to renting it out for, I mean, especially the price we were paying for it at the mm. time, I would never have gotten rid of that spot. But and that, best part about that spot, though, the cargo elevator. And because we were up on the second or the third floor, Dude, that, I'm telling you, that elevator was haunted. Dude, that entire building. That was building haunted. was no. It's you. It was the so. If you ever watch the Drowner Swell video, okay. Um, so we're gonna go back to like early values. The first song that Baker wrote for us. As in the band, we filmed a music video there. DIY, did it ourselves, you mm. know. Um, 90, well, not 90%, probably like 50% of that video was shot in that building. And it's just like, we went into this bathroom because every time you walk in, so the light would always be shining. No issues. As soon as somebody stepped in there, it would flicker, it would turn off. You would hear creaking, you would hear weird stuff. Like the whole building, the elevator had a floor that you couldn't go down to um like the button if you pressed it it wouldn't go so if we had to get you know we're on let's say floor three uh we need to go down to the main floor which would be floor one and then there's b for basement you would press one and the next thing you know it was just like straight up silent hill you'd end up the doors that open into the basement and it's just dark it's filled of wasn't that in the auto shop or like a like? Yeah, yeah. I, it was definitely a chop shop. It was not an auto shop. That was it, it was definitely a chop shop because actually this is uh, this kind of ties into the way we met Corey too because his old band was actually had a practice space in that basement, and I remember when we first started talking and everything, uh, he was just like, "Yeah, our practice space got shut down because there was like a wicked bad gas leak or something, <laughs> man." And I was just like. Wait, fucking what? Corey being spawned from the basement of a chop shop makes so much sense. <laughs> to get to their practice space. So to get to their practice space, you had to go through this door. And then literally you walk in and it's just like this same guy always in there in a, like a mechanic suit. OK, yep. but you definitely know this isn't like a business front. There's no signs. There's nothing. And there's just like seven vehicles torn apart. He's working on one of them. You yep. know, you would see him sitting there eating sandwich or something every time you walk by he's doing something different like i think the guy might live there but you had to walk through that spot and then there was a door that led to Corey's old band's practice yeah. spot it was it was so random yeah it, it, that practice spot i would describe it more as a closet than like a practice spot because you remember how small that was compared was, to where we were it was tight it was really small uh yeah but that's i i it, it, the second you brought up that elevator, I was just like, wait a second. No, that's that's where we got close with Corey and everybody because his yeah. old band was like uh, uh, there a lot of the same times that we were, which is – and we would just run into each other because we knew each other through shows and everything. And then we were like, hey, you practice here? Yeah, we practice here. And that's how all of that happened. It's just like the, camar the camaraderie that just randomly happens when everybody's in the same place at the same time. Yeah, that was – I, that was Nick Cosmos, if I'm not mistaken. That was, and then the other, the Headbanger Hotel was like two blocks up. Yep. 
Yep. Uh, it, it's still in Holyoke, still like not in the best area in the world, mm-hmm. but pretty sure bands still rent out rooms there and still apply. Oh yeah, no, I think uh, yeah, there's a bunch of bands that are still in the Headbanger Hotel. Like there's a, there's a ton, but. That, I love the name. Yeah, it's it, it really was. You could go there, and it's just like you walk down the hall, and it's any given night of the week. Bands are practicing. You walk by, people are you're yelling, "Oh, hey, what's up?" And like I said, it was great because the people. But in terms of trying to get practice done, I mean, mm-hmm. to go back to the, your original question, yeah. I mean, it, it was tough to practice because there's just so many distractions, so many hangs. Yep. You know. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to stand up and grab a refill in a second, but I want to get to, yeah, we've gone through a lot of the boundaries timeline to me. It's the, we're at the concluding part. So I know in 2020, the, this journey comes to an end. Uh, I guess my first question is kind of what precipitates that? Why does it become a good thing? And my other thought there before I stand up and go refill a drink and let you guys <laughs> chat for one second, uh, is that it's almost like perfect timing. So this the final show is in January, 2020. And it's like in the, in hindsight, of course, at the time you would never have known this, but March, 2020 is when the world shuts down. Uh, so every, I don't want to say every band break up then, but there was a lot of trauma and stress in bands. Like it was a really shitty time to try and be an entrepreneur of any variety. Ending in 2020 almost works out perfect for you guys. It made life so much better and easier. And it's like, yeah, now you get to restart with a good energy instead of ending because the world told you that. Like it was all in your terms, which I think is the key there. Um, but yeah, what precipitates that? Like that last show, what gets you to that moment? I think all of us were just. Burnt out. Burnt out. Yeah. Tired. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I had a straight up, like, I, I was, like, on the verge of a complete mental breakdown at that point. And it, actually, I ended up did, I ended up did having one. Like, and then I went into the hospital for a couple of weeks. And then when I get out of the hospital, everything shut down. And I was just like, oh, okay, well, this makes sense. That's I got to, right, yeah. I, I started off want, needing some time to myself. Now I got a lot of it. We didn't, we didn't quite get to that point yet, though, because we still, we did have the final show. But it was just leading up to that, I guess you could even say kind of bleeding over from that fall and winter into the new year, into 2020. Um, we could tell just kind of by everybody's, you know, vibes, I guess you could say, at practice, like just weren't into it. The music that we were demoing at the time and recording wasn't up to par. A mm-hmm. um, lot of arguments about you know, how something should sound, how something should be done, uh, rather than just let the person, for example, who's creating the riff do it or the person that's doing the vocals do their thing. You know, mm-hmm. everybody kind of had a different viewpoint on how it should sound or how it should be done, which wasn't really how values was. Yeah. You know, we, we were never like that. Like, we would pump out a riff. He would, he would have a riff. i put a drum part to it. Mike and Corey would be like, yeah, let's do this. And we'd... Honestly, like uh, that's kind of how practices were. We didn't really jam out stuff. We'd be like, "That riff is sweet. Let's record that right now." Except most of the time when I did that, you you would ask me to replay the the riff, and then, and then immediately he would forget it. Forget it. <laughs> like it would just be like one of those things. You're, I remember this happening so many times. I'd be like, "Yo, that's sick. What was that? What are you talking about? <laughs> what you just played? I don't know. It, it, wait, what do you mean you don't know? We can't just like record that and you can't remember." It? I'm like. Maybe I like the 2020 or 2023 version of you would just like have a GoPro in the recorder of the room running at all times just for that moment. Of like, just go back 10 seconds. What was that? Uh, no, if that if if values ever happens again, that's going to be need to be a thing. I'm going to need to have just like an amp cam just running the entire time. Mm-hmm. I mean, just, we, we we have so much recorded material. Um, I mean, we like I said, I mean, there were songs that we were working on that, hey, we weren't happy with, but we also have some songs that are just tucked away in the archives that I mean I love I mean he loves and I mean if they ever do see like the light of day you know it'd be cool um, and even the ones I'd, you don't love I assume you can repolish and right yeah, now with a refresh of eyes and ears I don't really know how people would react to it now mm-hmm. I mean maybe people would still eat it up and love it or maybe people would just kind of be like eh, move on from it but uh <laughs> It would just Who be knows? it would just be fun to make noise sometimes. Like I, sometimes I think about that. I'm like, you know what? Lugging eight cabs into a 150 person cap venue with Sucks. and pissing off the sound guy which sounds really fun right now. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a great way to spend. Lugging, an lugging all your cabs in sucked. Hey, one of them had wheels. <laughs> one of them. One of them. Yeah. Yeah, the one nine. of them had wheels, but the <laughs> coasters didn't work on them, so we still had to lift it. Hey, it had the wheels at one point. But yeah, I mean, it's just. Coming into those final days, I mean, I remember we had one practice where I don't think Mike was there. I think it was just you, Corey, and I. 
Um, we were demoing some stuff, and he just puts the guitar down mid-recording and just gets up and is like, yeah, I can't do this. I'm done. And walked mm-hmm. out. And Corey and I just kind of looked at each other like, what just happened? Yeah. You know, and, you know, Baker, like I, like he was saying, I mean, he had some stuff going on at the time, and I think we all kind of agreed a break would be good. Just um, too much time in the kitchen together, I guess. Is that a is that a fair summary? Just life in general. Yeah. You know, everybody has different things going on, whether it be work, whether it be, you know, personal, whether it be mm-hmm. relationship, you know. Yeah. Um, it just, I, it's just we realized at that time that, hey, this is, this is a good time to kind of let it mm-hmm. wind down and, and Which it. is the right and mature thing to do. Right. Yeah. You're like, when, when you know, when you start forcing something, it stops being fun. Mm-hmm. And you, you sometimes you look at it and like, yo, this is something I need to get past. But it, as soon as you feel like it's just like, no, I'm just forcing myself to we, do this. We just every started day. making timelines for no reason. I think that's the mm-hmm. other thing that just, like, the music, the quality of the music we were writing. I mean, we all felt it. Like, it just wasn't, like I said before, on par. But yeah, dude, it just it was going down. And it's, I feel like it's just because we felt like in our head, like, we were rushing ourselves, but for why? It's like, yeah. oh, do we have to keep up to the schedule that all these bands have? Oh, we got to put a single out every six months, or oh, we got to make sure, you know, it's been a year since we put our last album out. We really got to mm-hmm. put something out. And it's just like, who cares now? It's just, yeah. you know, the way I, I think we all kind of look back at it and be like, why? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. take your time with it, make sure it's done the right way. And yeah, for what it's worth, I don't necessarily mean to mine it in the sense of like looking for gossip or the drama, but I'm curious because to me, it's like bands are similar to relationships in that like 90% of them end, end. Like it's very rare that this thing doesn't end. And I think that's a kind of a dark underbelly, but it's a part that's common to all of us. And I mean, before values, you guys are in other bands that also go through similar things. And I don't know, I'm curious about those parts because that's something that never ends up on Facebook once the band breaks up, but it is real and it is important. And I think it's also something that like the, the local band starting now can learn from of like, yeah, what are the things that go wrong? And the, yeah there's a, the kind of placated formal answer of like, oh, creative differences. Like that doesn't mean anything. Creative differences literally means nothing. It's just like a way to not say anything else. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of why I pry and I'm curious about, yeah, what the I mean, actual thing is. Oh, if we're talking creative differences, you and me. I was just about, so, so <laughs> to, to be open and honest here, mm-hmm. towards the end of values, if you came to any of those last couple shows, you would see Baker and I mean, middle of our set, kind of getting into it. Um, frequently and mm-hmm. it was just way too frequently yeah i mean our last show there's video i mean somebody i forget who somebody recorded our entire set for the last show and it's clipped out whoever posted it to facebook clipped it out but we have the actual video mm-hmm. of it and there's a part where we stop after one of our songs we were supposed to play a certain song and baker's like no i, I don't want to play this and i was just like dude it's our last show i want to play it yeah and the next thing you know, him and I are just like kind of yelling. I'm like, dude, I said, we're going to fucking play the song. I mm-hmm. said, if you don't like it, so I'm going to get up right now. So I'm just going to beat your fucking ass right yeah. now. Like, I just, I mean, I said that to him and yeah. I, I look back. I mean, Baker's one of my best friends, like, you know, but just in the moment, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. It was a, it, it was just, none of us were in the right headspace for it mm-hmm. at the no. time. None of us were. And no. it, it sucks, but it's, it, it's good at this point having the time like away from each other. Like, yeah. even if it was kind of forced at a certain point um that we ended up just working everything out and making sure everything like we, we stayed friends throughout the entire thing because mm-hmm. actually i think it was the first time all of us were in a room was actually at our buddy alex's wedding, wedding. yeah uh back in like 2021 and that was the first time i'd seen any of them in mm-hmm. like t- like almost two years and i was like damn and it was just like boom right back to like us being like Really chill, close friends because we were all at the same table. We would still keep in touch, though. It's mm-hmm. not like you know we still our, our band chat. Mm-hmm. Oh, that it, never stopped. It never stops. I never. mean, it's it's constant, just memes and joking around and Me- you know reminiscing about things all the time. I mean, every day we we talk to each other on it. You know, I think that's the other part of this that's interesting is that you guys. Uh, the, the personal relationships maintained close, and I think that they are all now as close as they ever were, um, if, yeah, at least from my outsider perspective. But I think the interesting piece there is that, like, you guys yelling at each other on stage doesn't mean you hate each other. It's no. coworkers arguing, yep. which is really, and I think sports is the only place you see this sometimes. So, like, the coach, the head coach, and the star quarterback screaming at each other. And it's like they don't hate each other. They're just so focused on winning the Super Bowl together that this is how it comes out. So, you're and passionate think, about it. Yeah, and I think it's, it's important to keep in mind with the bands passion of, out. yeah, watching these arguments unfold. It's like, they are roommates. They do live together. There is a friendship there, but they're also coworkers, and this is a 
uh, yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting dilemma there of like, you are friends, but you have to be able to keep this thing of like, no, fuck you over this song, but not fuck you <laughs> as a person. I'm really mad about this one particular thing. I still like it, but I'm mad about this. Yeah. It was Dead Shelter. That's what it was. Yeah, that, that's the I, song. I hate. <laughs> I hate fucking play. I hate. I hate that I wrote that song. That's funny. I fucking hate playing it. I hate that I wrote it. Yep. It, it's, it's a tough song. <laughs> it's just. I th- it, it was. That was one of the songs I wrote just to be petty because I remember mm-hmm. we played a show at the Webster one time and someone was just like, "Oh, Baker, you can only play power chords, this, that, and the other thing." And I was just yes. like, "Oh, I can only do that. Okay, <laughs> fuck you. I'm gonna be really petty real quick and I'm gonna dump this in your lap next That's week." Funny. And we found out from a mutual friend that there was another band. That was kind of talking a little smack about us. I mean, it happens, you know, you're critical of other bands, but they took it a little too far and they're just like, Baker's just writes the same riff over and over again. He just recycles riffs. It's, it's all power chords. It's, you know, he can't actually play. So then he's just like, oh yeah, well. (laughs) Oh yeah. No, it it was extremely petty. Yeah. I I have no problem being petty with that guy and admitting that. I was just like, that's part of the reason I hate that song. That and playing that thing live after you've already been sweating over everything for the last 15, 20 minutes is just gnarly because I'm like, okay, there's a lot of tapping. My, my fretboard's all sweaty. My hands don't want to fully function properly. Ay, ay, ay. And it was like towards the end of the set that we had that in there too. So I was just like, guys, I'm tired. Mm-hmm. I'm sweaty. I am kind of hammered right now. Uh, and it was just, I'm like, I'm not going to be able to pull this off. It's going to sound like ass. Yeah. So I, w- I wanted to set it down on a good note, but it, we did. That's, yeah. and like that's what ended up mattering in the long run. It was mm-hmm. just like it just it, even that's those slight hiccups. Like it there, got, there, it got. There's only one show where we had to pull you off guitar. Oh it. no 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 no! We don't talk about we that. We don't talk about. We that. don't talk about that. <laughs> no, I think it's also wise then to call it on your own terms though. Where I think the other version of this is that you guys decide to keep going and try and keep going and try and make the thing happen. And the pandemic happens and life gets harder already for everyone and specific or. For everyone in general and for bands also. Um, I don't want to yeah, make exclusive to bands there. But uh, yeah, life gets hard and then you guys keep trying to make this thing work and it just blows up. And now the friendships are fractured as well as the band. Like I think it's noble to call it on your own terms and be like, no, we need to we need to pause this here. Um, I understand that, yeah, in 2021, you guys come back together, you become friends again. And I think that my understanding is that in the last couple of months, year, year-ish, you guys have started to come back together as a band and getting music going again. Uh, what like inspires this kind of resurgence-ish? Or is that happening at all? Uh, that's. It was more hmm. just kind of. It's something we've talked. We've ab- talked about talked it. Talked about it, yeah. but uh, we haven't actually like been. It, we haven't all played together mm-hmm. in such a long time. Yeah, we haven't played together since like our last show. That was the last time all of us were on our instruments all together in the same room. What we do do is, I mean, we we still like to hang out. We like to get together. Obviously, we like to create music. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have a little studio space in my basement. So a lot of the times if we're all free and it works out, we'll get together and we'll just write a song. But it's not necessarily values. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it may sound nothing like values, but we're just want to be want to be creative. You Mm -hmm. know, we want to be able to keep those creative juices going. Yeah. Um, You know, I never want to stop doing that. Um, Yeah. No, it's it. Yeah, that's kind of that, that. Yeah, that's kind of. I can agree with that on that one. Yeah, it's just like I never want to stop making stupid noises with a guitar. With just, mm. it, it's it's nice to do that every once in a while. It maybe it'll see the light of day at some point. Maybe it won't. Who knows? If you were betting men, is there a values show ever again? The environment has to be right. Okay, what does a right environment look like to you guys? People would want, to, obviously. Like, uh, I would want people to want it. Sure. You know, I wouldn't want to just come back to come back. I think if you announce that people want it, I think. If people think that you guys have put this thing to bed, then it's hard to want it. You know, I think it's uh, build it and they will come. Go back to the, go back to the yeah. early early yeah. value days. Yeah, it would just it, it would just have to be with a bunch of like our friends and everything. And it's mm-hmm. cool to see like a bunch of our older friends getting back at it and starting like new bands and everything. Like I know Burying Point with uh, one of our best friends Freddie, they're starting off and their new record is doing really really well. Mm-hmm. Then there's Dan with Chain Twist and everything, which hell is, yeah, Chain Twist is fucking gnarly. Um, yeah, it, it's just, it's, we would want to do it the same way we used to, where it was just us always playing with our friends' bands and just turning it into a, just a gigantic hangout session with just a lot of equipment. I wouldn't want to make it a business. I, yeah. I guess that's the best way to put it. And, yeah. you know, a lot of bands, obviously, I mean, it is a business in a way, you know, uh, you're selling merchandise, you're, you're, you're 
you're trying to profit off your merchandise, you're trying to profit off CDs, you're trying to mm-hmm. profit on door Cassette sales. Tapes. It's Cassette identity, tapes, it's whatever. marketing. Yep. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. And, you know, if we got to that point, I don't know if I would want that. You know, yeah. I just want to, hey, let's play with our friends. Let's get together. Let's play a show once a month somewhere. Um, sure, let's still order merch. Why not? I mean, mm. even when we were buying merch for ourselves to sell we were never overcharging for it i mean i think 30 bucks or a t-shirt's like ridiculous i mean we would always sell uh, our shirts 12, were always 10 bucks. bucks 10 12 bucks and it, it, we, we were just like i don't want to make money on it i just want to make back what we put into it mm-hmm. so we could print another design yeah and this is what's you know it's your it's a walking billboard that's mm-hmm. what's going to get people to hey who is that or what yeah. is that i'd rather have that than make 10 bucks on a t-shirt you know mm-hmm. what i mean it's funny. I remember somebody sent me a picture from a festival they were at in New Jersey, and there was some guy wearing a values hat, and I'm just like, what the fuck? How did it's it make it all the way down to New Jersey? New Jersey We've never yeah. even played New Jersey. Yep. How did you get there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but actually, I, I, kind of talking about merch. Merch was like one of my favorite things to help with for the band and everything. Just How's because I, He was in charge of merch. I was going to assume it was Mike. Okay. No, well, uh, Mike, Mike would do... They would work with each other, but Baker, when it came to the ideas, it's him the the layouts the designs like he would tell mike hey this is what i'm thinking do you think you can draw this up and then let's figure it out from there yeah and i was always a bigger fan of doing like the weirder stuff the stuff that like not a lot of the bands did like um like every band has t-shirts every band has hoodies not every band has pom-pom fucking embroidered hats in the winter or not booty every shorts. band has booty shorts. And I I think we're still like the only local that I've seen to print like ladies leggings before because I remember we did those and th- that was really fun. Do the weird items tend to sell better than the t-shirt? The yes. leggings went so quick. Yeah, leggings went so fast. Uh, like that... That's just something I've always like had a passion for just because I always look at like streetwear and such because like I, I'm a clothes guy myself. I like I have a lot of cool clothes and everything. Oh, I define them as cool. I don't care what other people think. I think they're sweet. So I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's like I just like you know, clothing's cool. And yeah. like I always like seeing like what other bands are doing. I'm like, OK, every band's doing this. Let's do something funky like mm-hmm. uh like the leggings were just like a shot in the dark. I was like, yo, what if we do this and we do like a Victoria's Secret pink rip and just throw it on a pair of leggings? And they sold they sold like that. And we were kind of against it at first. I bet. You know, I remember yeah. Corey was just like, Baker, we are not doing that. And then his girlfriend was like, I'd buy a pair. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> well, literally, if you th- like, uh, just to put my marketing hat on there, like, there's yeah. like a very slim amount of bands that market merch towards women, which mm-hmm. it, it, that needs to be a bigger thing because, like, yeah, at, the same the same small guy shirt isn't going to fit a, a girl the same way. It's sure. that type of thing. Yeah. So everybody's got to have something yeah, for that. We would actually order women's size T-shirts just to make sure we had them on hand. Yeah. You know, granted, it wasn't, you know, and then quad huge X. amount. Quad X. We had a couple of guys come up and go, you guys make quad X. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm writing something down that I don't want to say right now, but I do want to tell you guys once I turn the mics off. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> because it's a funny detail related to that. Um, hell yeah. So maybe revival, maybe show if, if the climate's right. Uh, is there anything else I skipped over on values that we should touch on? Uh, any other shows that stand out? Any memories that stand out? Any stories that should see the light of day before we pause our mics for the evening? <laughs> Driving on the mass bike with everything unread. Or was it the mass bike or where was it? Uh, we're going to Long Island. No, no. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, the Long Island one's better. <laughs> Uh, we were driving with both. We got plenty. I'm on no rush. Yeah. Oh, so we were driving down to Long Island one time. Just to, to interrupt, play. these are stories that, like, we. The only reason we're bringing them up is because we still talk about them and Hell joke yeah. around God. about them and say, "How did we get away with this?" Like, I am excited. Hell yeah! So it, it, we were driving with a truck and a trailer all the way down to this place in Long Island. We've never been to Long Island before. And I hate driving there. Yeah. Um, we do too. Uh, the best part about it was we got stuck, I think, in uh, Brooklyn and, in traffic, and Corey's were blasting Creed. Corey's yelling out the window, "Yo, you guys like Creed?" Just at everybody, everybody. we drove by. P- everybody. It's, it's, it was a summer day. People have their windows down. We're driving by, and it'd be like a family. It'd be like a mom and dad, and they're yeah. two like young kids, <laughs> and we're blasting. And Corey would just be like, "Yo, you guys like Creed?" Just, just like, like Scott Stab asking everybody. Yeah. Um, but the reason we're just like, well, how did we get away with this is we took everything on the parkway 
and you're not allowed to drive with a trailer on the parkway. <laughs> and we did not know that until we got down there. Nice. And every local guy who was there just looked at us like, hey, how'd you guys get here so quick? And like, oh, yeah, no, we took uh, the parkway. We took this bridge. And they we just came this way, went across this bridge, and they're like, with the trailer? We're like, <laughs> yeah. And they're like, dude, like, you're not supposed to do that. Like, that's a huge fine. Yeah. And I remember, like, we as I'm driving, tolls. like, there were cops, like, on the other side. We drove by them. And I, I mean, I'm not thinking anything of yeah. it. Like, just didn't even realize what we had done. They're just like, like, dude, like, you're lucky you didn't get, like, pulled over and towed. Yeah. And, was, and here's what would have made that story even worse, because this happened around the same time. At this time, either the truck, the trailer, and, bo- and or both were not registered. Nice. And we were rolling around like that for I'm, a I'm, solid year. I'm not nice. irresponsible. I'm nice. on top of my stuff. But nice. I had just bought a house at the time, and I don't think they had my new address for anything, and I didn't realize that. <laughs> Well, I think the way we found out my is registration for the trailer lapsed. and the truck had. Oh, gotcha. So, yeah, 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 it's like here we are just, you know, here's Corey with a pint of whatever on him. You know, here's Baker with a 30 pack. Uh, yep. <laughs> you know, it, we're just driving, cruising along the, uh, you know, the highway, you know, but yeah. an unregistered truck, unregistered trailer. It's like you get pulled over. It's just like, all right, boys, you know why I'm pulling you over? Mm. No. Well, you were speeding. Okay. Um your truck and trailer unregistered. Do you have any uh, alcohol or drugs on you? Oh, I see beer. All right, guys, out, out of the vehicle. You oh, know. yeah, no, the beer was going to be the least of the worries. I, like, I would have had, an, I would have had an eighth on me at all times. There's <laughs> also like an absurd, um, what should we call it, Uber fee. Like, this is pre-Uber, but like to get someone down there to pick up all your stuff. Also, like getting you guys home from Long Island would be anno- like an annoyance, but someone could drive two hours and get you. But to find someone who could also get all your gear home would be a disaster. So I've actually had an experience like that. Please. Um, this is with eyes like mine, the band that Baker mentioned before. We were playing up at Ma- uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. So, do you remember the venue Rocco's? Mm-mm. No, oh, okay. So, there's a, a venue Rocco's, pretty story. pretty popular venue. But we, at the time, I had a uh, God, it was like a 2004 Ford Exploder. That's what we call it, Exploder. You know. Um, anyway, we got everything packed in my Explorer. We don't have a trailer. Um, the other guys are in another vehicle. And we're about maybe 25 minutes out of New Hampshire. And all of a sudden, you know, my engine light comes on, it's flashing, vehicles shaking, and then it just dies. And I'm like, oh, boy, this is uh, not good. And, you know, we were one of two locals on this show. Um, I think we were playing with, I think the headliner was, like, The Color Morale. I think that's who it was at the time, them, and, like, Monster Flames was on it. Mm-hmm. It was a pretty, at the time, like you'd think 2010, cool. yeah. you know, it was a pretty cool show. I'd still go to that show, yeah. yeah. And um, There's video evidence of this. There's like this, a there, whole vlog. There's a whole, did. like, vlog of it that is on YouTube. Okay. It's, I mean, I'll show you afterwards. You'll laugh. Um, but anyway, we don't know what to do. I'm like, we got to get to the venue. We call the promoter. He's a dickhead and didn't want to hear it. We explained everything that had to go on. So I have AAA. And AAA is only supposed to you know tow you one way so instead yeah. of saying hey guys we're not going to make the show calling triple a let's get towed back it was like hey i need you to tow us to manchester new hampshire at this venue and i'll worry about getting home somehow later. you know yeah. somehow we'll worry about it later so we get up there and it's funny that the, this video just starts out with this tow truck backing up and just lowering my suv into a parking <laughs> spot and all these kids are standing outside the venue like what is going on? <laughs> Rappers show up in Lambos. Yeah, yeah. Jordan shows, shows up, up in with tow a trucks. fucking tow truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the funny thing is, I think somewhere in that video, it's like us with the tow truck driver going up to the venue. He's like, oh, so what kind of music you guys play? It's like, oh, we play, uh, you know, it's like this, you know, mm-hmm. singing, screaming, whatever. Oh, really? You got an example? It's like, I didn't have my own band CD, but I had like my iPod on me. And it was just plugging it in. So this dude's just like listening to... It was Abacab. I think it was, yeah. I think it, it was, was Abacab. I think it was the Abacab album the whole way up, and he was just like, what, what is going on right now? <laughs> you know, clueless to, like, what heavy metal was. I like the, uh, the uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, the lavishness of instead of getting a driver for your car, you get a whole other vehicle to drive your car. <laughs> Literally. So it, it gets better. We get there, the, the promoter's yelling at us. Mm-hmm. Um, our bass player at the time, so this is pre-Baker, uh, our bass player, Scott, great guy. No, that was Dreamus. It was Dreamus at the time. Scott was before that. 
You're right. I think it was Dreamus at that show. Yeah, we I, went through a couple of bass players. I wasn't even in no the worries. band at that point. How the fuck no. do I remember? No, that's what I'm saying. You weren't there. But, well, <laughs> you've apparently seen the video. I, I don't know. It's hilarious. But, you know, he kind of gets into it with the, the promoter. Like, dude, mm-hmm. we just towed our freaking shit up here so we could play your show. And I think it was he was harassing about ticket sales. It's like, oh, you promised us 25 tickets and you only sold 18. So you got to buy the other seven. He's like... Yeah, we need to also buy parts to repair this vehicle so we could get home. So you could fuck off. Yeah. So he's just like, all right, well, you got 20 minutes to get on stage, you know. So we're rushing everything in there, loading everything in there, play our set. I'm not worried about anything except for going to this pizza shop that was down the road, Olympus Pizza. Dude, that. Uh, pizza. Dude, I never got to. I, I the, the only time I played Rocco's was when I was like 15 or 16 years old. Um, and I played New Hampshire Death Fest with Kill Whitney Dead. That's the only time I ever played that place. And my mom took me. Hell yeah. And she was just like, they're drinking beer in the parking lot. And I'm like, I'm 15, 16. I'm like, yeah, okay. You just do cool. the going inside the venue. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm inside. Now it's, now I'm that guy. So, um, so yeah, no, I've only been to Rocco's tw- like two or three times, and I was playing it every single time. But didn't it like get busted for being a meth lab? Or yeah, something? The ba- it got busted because the basement en- ended up being a meth lab. Bummer. Which was yeah, what happens. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Oops. What ha- but no. So what anyway, what happens in New Hampshire turns into a meth. Yeah, lab. It was a zoning <laughs> conflict. <laughs> Figured out what's wrong with the vehicle. I call my uncle up, who's like just car mastermind. You know? Hell yeah. These are the days before Corey, because Corey is the guy to go to for any type of vehicle work, like. You know, if there's something wrong, he knows what's up. And that was always the nice thing, too, about traveling. Like, he mm-hmm. could do all the maintenance on the vehicles, the trailer, all that. So I had to buy a new battery in New Hampshire. Put a new battery in my car. Alternators, what's bad. So now the battery's not going to get a, a charge. Mm-hmm. So this got me all the way to Worcester. And it was me and Mike May, because Mike was the merch guy. Everybody packed into our buddy Kyle's car, because they're just like, we don't trust this. <laughs> and they were 100% right. Yep. So we're stranded on the side of the Mass Pike, broken down with all this equipment. Nice. And we had to sit there and wait three hours for a tow truck to come. And it was after midnight. So it counted as a new day that was able to use my tow. And that's the only reason we got home. Thank goodness. Like, yeah, because it's like, what, 100 miles a day or something? I, I Dude, we didn't get home until it was like... 5 30 in the morning and okay. it should have been back by one, 12 yeah. 30, one. yeah it was and miserable every band should have one member that has triple a every yep. single one because mm-hmm. triple and a plan a, of fitness black yeah yeah that too yeah, it, it will save your ass no mm-hmm. matter what yes yeah. oh your shit breaks down cool free toe yeah. oh you got a flat free new tire oh you need to get jumped here you go yeah. I'm just convinced that vehicle was cursed because we also <laughs> played the Palladium and my windows got smashed out. Well, Hell yeah. It was a Ford. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't let us park in the parking lot. Oh, you got to pay for parking. And at that time, I'm just like, dude, $10 is a beer. No I'm not paying for parking. Yep. You know, I sh- should have paid for the parking. Hell yeah, Kings. Uh, we are just about at our good mark here. Uh, is there anything we should, uh, with our good last stories there, where should people look out for? Where should people find you? Where can they follow you online? What should people look out for? Um, Mr. Brendan Baker. Oh, God. Oh, you're on TikTok. Yeah, Mr. I mean, Brendan I'm, Baker is on TikTok. Yeah, right? I'm on TikTok at Made of Spite, and okay. I, I stream on Twitch uh, yeah. under the same name. Hell yeah. It's of spelled with a V, though, because black metal's cool, um, and I don't like spelling things correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, or don't know how to, but it's fine. Oh, yeah, no, my, auto, <laughs> my autocorrect, uh, even if I spell correctly, goes to the misspelling now. It's, it's that bad. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, that's about Twitch, TikTok. Uh, I'll have all that in the, the description bio, whatever bullshit. Jordan, what are people, or did I cut off anything? Oh, else no, there? No, Instagram, that's... Twitter, Facebook, whatever else should be, should yeah. be happening. All of that stuff's linked off that. So it don't really matter. Nice. One, you find one, you'll find all of them. Perfect. Jordan, where do people find you? What do they look out for? What is, what's going on in the world? It's just my first and last name. Perfect. One of the least interesting people. You've that's ever come all across. it should be. Try to keep it simple. Hell yeah. Case. But no, I mean, I, I have my Facebook you can follow me on or Twitter and I also have uh, my card account because I do collect sports cards and um, trading cards so I uh, apologize in advance but I know Jordan's a big Eagles fan so if you love the Eagles as much as he does please reach out to him tell him how much you love him send him some merch send, send stuff his way 
Um, I'm sorry to end on that note. For some reason, that had to come out of my mouth. But I appreciate you guys coming on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I had to end it on those terms. Uh, but I appreciate you coming through. It's fun to go through the value story and live through live through the journey. Yeah, I hope there is a future chat. So I hope I get to be yeah get to be there if if it were to happen. Um, but yeah, best of love to you guys. I'm sure we'll talk soon. We got plenty of catching up to do once the mic's cut off as oh, well. Oh fuck yeah! <laughs> fuck yeah! Hell yeah, kicks. <laughs>